It's like this though. It wouldn't be fair to say that yeah, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens because it does. Just like it does in every family. You know what I mean? It's just a more personal business to to an artist when something happens. And uh yeah, and, and that's why it just kind of stands out a little bit more, but you know, for all the good to hear somebody laugh remedies anything that can happen behind the scenes bad. Real talk. Or else there would be not one comedian in the world. Yeah, boy! Remember the dare to keep your kids off drugs, drug programs? Yeah. I never understood the concept of that because truth or dare, truth or dare, truth, drugs are fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen this, this new campaign, Above the Influence? Like, like, like where it's like, yeah. I don't do drugs, I'm above the influence. I was like, lame. Lame. <laughs> 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 You're above the influence. You're above the influence, but I'm higher. This is how you workshop material. You just you start pulling stuff out of every. Feed me popcorn. Anything worth it's, it's, it's never fun. You're doing a tutorial on comedy. It's just amazing any of us have come up with any material ever with just the random stuff that comes out of our mouths. Say, thank God we got a baby gate to keep that dog in the room we wanted to get in. Yeah. Oh, let's see if he can climb up the other side. Yes, he can. Oh, so great to have a dog. You can just... You have a baby gate to keep me away? I don't care. I'm a puppy. And a lot of people look at my little puppy and they're like, Oh, look at those paws. He's going to be huge. Oh, you're going to have a big dog on your hands. And I don't want that to happen, so I'm just going to cut off his feet. <laughs> Oh, gee, it feels just stay the same size. There's a rush whenever more than two people laugh. And it's hard to explain, but after the first time you get up there and you don't completely shit your pants uh, and, and people enjoy it, you, there's no better feeling. Um, it's, it's, I mean, we're all junkies. And this pot's good. It's the laugh, period. It's, I don't know how to describe it. I don't know how, because, you know, like other comics have said, you know, bad things happen. Bad things happen to everybody. And it just does. Like, I have bad things happen in my life. Bad things happen in your life. Doesn't make me more special than you. Doesn't make you more special than me. But when I have that outlet, and it's just something about when I finish a sentence on something bad in my life, and you know, I finish a sentence and I can make a room full of people who don't know me, who don't know me at all. When I finish that sentence and they laugh, now, that's better than cocaine. Um, when you do it and then like um, you're done and like you, like I don't really have a sense of how it goes when I'm up there because all I can think about is like not like um, puking up or something like that or just like passing out. But um, when I'm done, and I feel like I did really well, like I said what I intended to say, and then the people listening enjoyed themselves, like, I f it feels really good in a way that's difficult to describe. Like, you feel like you really accomplished something. But, um, that's probably just a sign of my massive psychological defect. Do you know how this is America, and it's the year 2011, but gay people can't get married in every state? 
And some people who are opposed to gay marriage make the argument that it's a slippery slope. First you let a man marry a man, and then a man's going to want to marry his horse. And I think that's crazy, because nobody fucks a horse because they want to marry it. You fuck a horse because it can't tell on you. That's just science. I can't, that's not going to tell anybody. Watching your own comedy. Damn, these jokes are funny. <laughs> these jokes, man, these jokes are dope. Just leave it there. So, all right, I went and got the broom and dustpan again. And that's not enough for a con. So, I had to have gloves to touch the broom and the dustpan <laughs> to touch the sweep it. That's not enough either. Like, by the time I'm done, I'm in a full body hazmat suit in 98 degree weather. What you doing, Grayley? Checking out these jokes. Going over your old set list? Yeah, these, this is like new shit that I wrote on old set lists. <laughs> it recycles. Yeah. Are you reading your set for No, just, it's more like a, like a, yeah, sort of, I don't know, maybe. I'm a hack. I'm not original at all. Started out in West Virginia where people don't like to laugh, apparently. <laughs> Nobody knew what comedy was. Like, this town, there was a town, and then all of a sudden there was a comedy club, and everybody's just seen it on TV. They didn't know anything about it, and there was no stand-up comedians in the town beforehand. Uh, and now there's, like, what, seven, so... I had a girlfriend, she told me one time, she was a freak. Uh, she told me she wanted to rape her. The whole nine yards, break in, slap her around, put her against the wall. She didn't tell her neighbors she wanted me to rape her. <laughs> I had done open mics in Huntington. I'd done open mics in Marley's Doghouse. And it took me a little while, but I finally got to where I was actually like getting laughs. And I would do the same thing every fucking week. And when I finally got to where like it was going good, the funny bone was. So I don't know if I was at the first open mic there, but I was at my first open mic at a comedy club. Was that the Honey to Funny Bone? And then at the same time, we used to do where the headliner would come into town. He comes into a town where there's nothing to do, really. So, hey, let's hang out and tell me some jokes, tell me some insider information. And then we had the ability to go into the club and hang out um, and catch a lot of stuff when you can't. I mean, if there's like 30 or 40 comics doing it every weekend, you can't do it. But when there's two guys, you, you could definitely do that. And for a long time, me and I felt as strong as like the two comics in Huntington. Then the comedy club uh, got bought out uh, by a new guy, and so they kind of just completely like changed the staffing and everything, and just made it a, a whole new funny bone, I guess. And and um, this new guy's philosophy was to book big names. I booked uh, this television show, and it was, I ended up making a, a streamline through the funny bone of this TV show, and then all of a sudden the funny bone uh, the funny bone closed. And um, and it was all financial reasons and whatnot, but it was gone. Preparing for your show, Mike. I got pineapple on my cake as soon as you record. Absolutely right. Is that your Showtime fuel pineapple? Pineapple and chocolate. I got muscle milk too, Bubble. I, like I never trusted muscle milk because it sounds way too pornographic. I'll see you over there. There you go. Wow. Yeah. That's it. That's a nice room. Uh -huh. Yes. Here it is, man. That's what we're doing now. Not bad. That's a problem. Too many people want to hear comedy. That's a problem. What? People want to hear comedy. Let's do it. That's where they want to put us. It's a good look, Mike. Yeah. How are you feeling for the show, Keith? I'm feeling fine. <laughs> I'm feeling fine. That's always a good deal. Nice and medicated. I'm, I'm ready. 
Nice. It's nothing but time now. He took a piece of XD before he got here. Oh, he's all cleared out. That expectorant worked. No thanks to the government. <laughs> I don't think we expected this many. Uh, I Red Bull been laying off of it lately because my doctor told me that it was missing my heart. Red Bull hit you all once, just like boom, 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 boom. He told me it was wearing on my heart valve, and my friends started making fun of me. I'm like, your heart's a pussy. I'm like, no, it's not because it was. Six weeks off the Red Bull, and I'd be nice and tight again. <laughs> Alright, one more time, a uh, round of applause for the guys, everybody. Big round of applause. I was my soul, kind of the biggest metaphor going comedy hard on right now, ever. Uh, the next guy coming to stage, he's the reason I do comedy. Give it up for Mr. Keith Terry! Exactly. <laughs> I am sick of them putting that crap on the news. I, I thought she was already in jail. Thank you, Keith Terry. God bless you all. Thank you, Keith Terry. 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 Thank you, Thank you very much. We'll try and use it in a couple of weeks. Have a good night. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Pastor Alex. Be safe. You're your own roadie at this point. You you're, you're, you're your own groupie too, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? See how many ladies are here waiting. Okay. Bank comedians. Not. It was a shock to me, like anybody else, that the funny bone was just shut down, and so it, it shut down. And I legitimately looked into opening the place. I, I did business plans. I kept it under wraps. Me and my roommate, we looked into it. We were like, let's see what it would take to get this place open because my roommate used to work at the Funny Bone and, and he was the original sound guy, technical guy for the Funny Bone. And we looked into it and we were like, let's see what it would take to get this place open. And just after talking with a couple of banks and business people, we realized that it was not economically feasible and that we would be in debt for the rest of our lives for something that probably wouldn't work. And then it lay dormant for a little while and talk was a brewing, you know, I heard from other people who knew other people and knew Dave and all this other stuff and they were going to give it one more try. Well, they, they started and I honestly thought that this round was going to be it. It was here to stay, you know, they, they revamped the kitchen staff and had a new kitchen manager who used to run a restaurant or ran other restaurants and stuff. I also learned in college that there's some really good pot out there because there's rich kids come to school with all the parents' money and they're like, we can afford the good stuff, yay! Awesome! Like, have you ever smoked stuff so good it makes you sleep and eat in that order? <laughs> Smoke a bunch, pass out, and you wake up the next morning and you just tear your pantry and refrigerator in ass. <laughs> Take that, salami! What pissed me off was I went through like two or three interim general managers or owners or, or runners or whatever the fuck these fucking people were. I don't, I didn't know them. I don't, I didn't, I didn't know their names. They point the finger at me. Everybody that got banned from the Funny Bone because we wasn't what they was looking for. And I feel that uh, I was funnier than half the big names that they had coming in there. But, you know, I just wasn't what they was looking for. And I think uh, <laughs> if you want a good story, that's what motivated me to do what I'm doing these days is Funny Bone. So thank you, Funny Bone. Absolutely. Thank you very, very much. I heard a lot of bad things about the people who were running the place, but it, me personally, I interacted with these people and I never had a problem with them. I never saw any drama or felt like I wasn't welcome that time and thought things were going great and then it's closed. So they just shut their doors. And they were, I was like, well, what? And they are like, money, we're not making enough money. And a lot of people would complain, they're like, well, you give away so many free tickets. Well, think about this in comedy. If you don't give those free tickets away, there won't be butts in the seats to begin with. That's just not going to happen. I mean, I know you want people to pay for the door, and some will, 
But if you really want butts in the seats, you might as well get some people in there for free. They'll at least order food and make the make, make the kitchen some cash. You know, you damn, I miss their sweet potato fries, motherfucker. It it closed. I mean, I really don't know the details because that the the old the funny bone. How many funny bones are there? One, two, three, three. Okay, I, my first open mic was in like the last, on the last leg of Funny Bone 2. And then uh, Funny Bone 3 opens up, and then I just, you know, show up and start doing stuff. And I was lucky enough that the, the management at the time liked me enough, I guess. So I got some, I got some work here and there. To... Has anybody here ever heard of Chat Roulette? You guys have seen some wiener. <laughs> You can say all kinds of different things, but it just looks like a comedy, a corporate comedy club in this town is just not meant to be. I mean, they've had three go rounds, and everybody, everybody that's a part of all these different clubs, say, can say like all these different things about like, oh, well, my com whenever I was involved, it closed down because of this, and whenever I was involved, it closed down because of this. But I think. I don't know, in the end, maybe three strikes are out, you know, maybe it's just not meant to be here now. Let's give it a little bit of time. Huntington, I think, because of the things that have happened here, uh, such as the plane crash from Marshall, um, as well as Jamie Oliver coming here when we were like the fattest city in the nation, has sort of... May Huntington seem to be a, a place that doesn't believe in itself and it doesn't want to be involved in anything to, to, to feel better. It's like almost it's comfortable with being in a bad state. I don't know. I, I love the city, don't get me wrong. I just think that Huntington people, which is made up of a lot of different types of people, they just don't care about anything. They want to just go to work and when they do have money to spend, they spend it on probably drugs. I don't know. Good to be here in a place of diversity. I see there's like a lot of different people, man. Where I'm from, I'm from West Virginia too. And the part I'm, the part I'm from here, either white or dead. That's how it works. It sucks. So I'm glad to be here with people that like. Like I want to move. Is what I'm trying to say. Someone help me move. <laughs> I think it's a great town because it has people. <laughs> in town that has people is a great town for stand up. Some ears to hear and some people to tell it is a good place. Especially hungry. People need it like that. <laughs> There's too many people in West Virginia with problems, and I don't know where the root of it all is, but some of them all look like they got that face, you know, like that oxycotton face. <laughs> <laughs> The healthy Oxycontin users, they have those teeth way down deep. Like, you gotta look real good. Like, like, Alright. If you wanna get down to what I would consider the essence of it, I feel that we are, like, Huntington as a town, right, like, as it is right now, is degraded to the point where without, without Marshall, it would, like, dry up and blow away. Like, you've got the, you've got the hospitals and you've got the mall, but a lot of those are fed except for maybe in the holiday season and other, other times like that, by the university. But I just know that it, whenever I, before I was in comedy, I loved it. I always wanted to go to the Funny Bone, but I couldn't get people to go. And I do not know why, whether it was too much money, this and that. People around here would rather get drunk than go watch live performers. Like I think that, at least in my demographic, I don't know. I really think that, that maybe what killed the Funny Bone is an uneducated uh, populace, so to speak. People didn't know that you could go and maybe pay, you know, ten bucks and see just, you know, some really good comics. People didn't know that they had halfway decent food. Uh, I just don't think people understood what to expect from a comedy club, or what the comedy club really was, and so they stayed away from it. That was like a power vacuum that sort of fell through whenever, whenever the uh, Funny Bone closed the last time. 
and it just, I don't know, so many different people were, I guess, grabbing for power. It was like the fall of Rome, and you know, in the end, uh, he was stuck in the Dark Ages, so. I love sleeping on love seats because they make me feel like a fucking giant. <laughs> We're gonna go see Kurusan at his working establishment. And show him these ridiculous posters. These ridiculously awesome posters. I have one of these to present to you. <laughs> 40. Yeah. A, a hurricane. No Dude. shit, you're a ghetto. You're the show. You didn't want a cobra? Dude, I still reserve. Get some blunt wraps, dude. Reserve. I need an ID. I got my ID, son. It's required for this person. I think you should be okay. Bitch, you are pretty rad, man. Here's your government. They moved the open mic to a bar to try to keep it going. It went okay for like the first two months, I guess. Then it just died again. Then, <laughs> then we started doing shows for Chico, because you know what else was there to do? Who am I? The future. Simplified. He was booking fabulous locations at gay bars and old rundown redneck bars. Classy. You can imagine how those turned out. But there was nothing else to do, so. Be a part of this, man. Come on, dude. You know, I'll be an extra, dude. You're already right here, and, and you know what? Even if you get on here and act stupid on the stage, we're talking about just on stage, man. Just get up here and fucking. If you can't make a fucking uh, customer laugh. I bet I could fuck the gay out of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck it. All that's gonna happen is he's gonna get a free prize. The next comic's gonna go try to make him laugh. I didn't compare it to uh, jokes that were supposed to make people laugh. <laughs> Just, uh, let's see. You want to do some filmmaking? The New York Academy is taking applications right now. 1-800-66-FILM. It looks like you can do a one or two year uh, conservatory. You can get a Master of Fine Arts area or your bachelor's and get your master's at the New York City. Not interested in that, all right? Whatever. You don't have to be the best comic. You don't have to be a good comic. All you gotta do is just man, you're so fucking good at it. You don't even realize it. And you don't even fucking realize it. Is somebody coming? Oh, get them! They're going the wrong way. They're going the wrong way. I can't do anything about it now. Okay, cool. Now you can't back up. Right here. Yeah. Hey, Friendly. What's up? Just got a letter <laughs> on our door. Chico has arranged a stand-up show for the 19th. Who leaves a note on your door? The Mafia? Right now, that's like what we're about to go do. We're about to go do our thing, you know? Do our thing in Lex Vegas. Is that what they call it? That's what the cool kids call it. It's pretty sexy. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty sexy. We're like, holy shit, like this is it. This is the crossing point. What, into Kentucky? Wait. Ah! 
I, I, right whenever I was like halfway in between both states. Oh, okay. nice. Yeah. That's, that's good luck, dude. I wonder how Bloods and Crips feel about the American flag. <laughs> but I do smoke a little weed often. <laughs> so I guess you can call me a stoner. So that's how this next show came about. So that's it. I mean, you just have to set up your own shit and move somewhere else for somebody else to say this shit. Right. So I'm playing. I'm playing. Where do you want to go? And can I come with you? I'm probably going to go to Florida, honestly. I have family there. I can fuck with the Florida trip. What else was I supposed to ask my mom? Can I bring you Jesus? Yeah, can I bring your Savior? Like, oh my god. She'd be like, oh my you. It's him? That's what somebody around my house would say. Is it him? And everybody's leaving and Barbel stays in Huntington. Yeah, yeah only, to Denver. only for two years. Fuck, I'd go to Denver too, just for like legal blood. So I have never had anybody in here. Um, last week I got caught masturbating. Is that what I mean? Yeah, it's the most awkward way ever to keep out a pet smart. <laughs> That's what got it going, actually. It triggered it, because I can always think better after I release some. Um, the guy wouldn't buy my excuse that I was just trying to add more protein to the kibble. I don't understand. So how soon are you leaving, Chrisanne? I don't know what's going on. I don't know winging it right now. Honestly, well, I think everyone's winging it at this point, but I mean, shit, dude. Okay. Shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. But here's the thing: if he's the only one setting up shows, then like you're not really shows. You're not getting any exposure. The only exposure you're getting is to your name that you fucking put on the poster yourself. That's it. Nobody's coming to see you right. except for us. Yeah. And right. the five people that he told. Now, my brain has a weird way of taking things that are completely irrelevant and somehow making them even more irrelevant yet seem important. It's like Sarah Palin, only it's a brain. <laughs> I don't know Chico. My only experience with Chico, with Chico has been, who's that guy over there drinking? <laughs> Someone saying, oh, that's Chico. And me going, oh, cool. <laughs> that's about it. He finds clubs that no one else can find, including the people that actually go to these bars. Um, but he, um, I think he puts in a lot of effort. Chico, like one word, is just aspersions. Like, I don't care if you know what that word means, audience of this documentary, or Chico, I know you don't know what that word means. Because uh, it doesn't rhyme with tequila. Oh. Did you know that, I think this crowd worked for this, the United Nations, like three weeks ago, decided that gay people were actually people. Yay. Like, they like, yes, I know, you're all here, and I'm looking at you, you're obviously people. I'm not stoned enough to think everyone's a robot. He has, and I'll credit him for this, massive ideas that he wants to do. Uh, and and what, if he could do it like he would want to do it, and the whole world bended unto Chico, then wonderful things could happen. But the fact is, nothing's ever going to bend unto Chico the way Chico goes about things. Not only am I in West Virginia, I'm going to infect all of West Virginia. From Morgantown to Beckley, so... I mean, I'm sure that anybody will agree that I'm more than a comic. I'm the one that goes out here and does this, gets the shows, you know, gets these venues, people to believe in, businesses, uh, musicians, comics. I mean, I do it all. Most of the time, he was pretty hammered, which was an unfortunate thing. I always told him, don't do time stoned or drunk or anything, you know. Have up here. Maybe. I would drink, like, I don't drink anything but water now before I get on stage. Once I get off stage, I'll hammer some beers, but I have to be absolutely sober. I can't concentrate. I can't remember my lines, you know, and my set and all that good stuff. Chica doesn't care. He just got up there and walked around the stage and just looked at people. I will, you know, satisfy you like nobody can. I will mow your lawn. It will stay clean. I will make you salsa and chips like I know a lot of you like. I'm on the 
supposed to be selling Yeah, you're drugs. supposed to be the drug dealer. The oh. sketchy looking black guy in the hoodie. I'm really bad at this. I got some Flintstone vitamins. Sell me some crap, man. I got some vitamins. I, I don't need vitamins, dude. That just makes really expensive tea. Oh, dude, that, that'd be the shit. I got some heartburn like a mug. I got those chewable Pepco shits. Oh, man, you got that chewable shits? Man, he'll hook me up, homeboy. With the shits. With the shits? For the I shits? For the shits. Yeah. Chico! Great set! I'll put it online so you can see it, dude. Thanks. Thanks for coming out to Uncle Chico's show. Brown loving. <laughs> That's what we call it. Is that what you call it? Uh, I was just kidding, man. <laughs> I was trying not to include Eric Hey, show us some penis. Was there any ticket money? Where was there? <laughs> Not enough. There wasn't probably anything to really worry about. Yeah, nothing crazy. I didn't even know what the fuck was Yeah. I didn't even know who the fuck was Yeah, he did. He did. He was getting money. Oh, Chico, he tries so hard. He's got a good heart, I'm not gonna lie. He he wants to do well, but he's just such a silly fuck up. I don't give a shit. I'll do a show anywhere. You know? Hell, I'll perform for, you know, three blind mice and a cockroach. I don't care. Uh, I hate doing a... <laughs> I hate doing a show with, you know, just a few people on it, but I will. I mean, I'm a performer. I'm a professional. And, um, all, I, all I can do is the, the, uh, the best that I can for what I got to work with. But, I, like, there's just been... It just seemed like the stuff that... I've seen him put on, has sort of ran a little too loose for my liking. But they've always been good times, but it's just, you know, I can have a good time shooting a BB gun at like pop bottles. I did one Chica show at the Polo Club and I thought it was really fun. There were like a lot of people there and there were like, um, uh, like, uh, it felt, I felt like there were a hundred comedians and then there was a, like, like, I don't know why, but he made everybody food and he could eat it. And then we all just ate burritos and told jokes, and I thought the show was really fun. What do you think of it, Grayley? I don't know. I like that vibe. Dude, there's a big gay birthday party going on right in front of the stage. I don't mind that. They don't want to see a bus. I don't know what, yeah, I don't know about this. I thought that was a happy accident because I think that uh, it was funny to um, interrupt someone's birthday <laughs> with a surprise comedy show. Like, um, I think I'll just go to this bar and have my birthday. Oh, um, good news. <laughs> There's also um, 60 fat guys who are going to talk about their dicks right in front of you. That was fun. Just in time for shots. Happy birthday. Whose birthday is it? Hey, Terrence. Terrence. Happy birthday, man. Man, this joke is for you. I gave it to you for your birthday. Um, I used to work at a movie theater, and among my many duties at this movie theater, I had to work the concession stand. And one time, this guy came in, and he ordered a bunch of this stuff, and I towed it all, towed it all up. And apparently, it's the first time he'd ever run into the concept that at movie theaters, uh, the concessions cost a lot. Because uh, the total was like something ridiculous, like thirteen fifty, and he handed me a twenty dollar bill, and he looked me dead in the eyes, and he said, "Oh man, twenty spend like fives nowadays. At least that's what they say in Malibu." And I said, "Oh man, what an incredibly natural way to let everyone at this concession stand know that you've been to Malibu." <laughs> this wasn't this wasn't shoehorned into the conversation at all. It was just tumbled right out your lips as if it were the most natural thing in the world to mention that you knew the vernacular of Malibu? Please sir, no, do not go away. Let me cling to the hem of your garment. Fill me with more of your wisdom about these far off lands. This is but the Huntington Mall Cinema 6. I have never even heard stories of distant Malibu. Please, if 20 spend like fives, what do fives spend like? Are they but a penny? Uh, I feel bad. I feel bad. But I love Chico. Don't get me wrong. I really do love him in a way that I love any stray dog. Uh, I don't know. 
I want him to be. I want. To, I want to get him fixed. I want to find him a nice home. <laughs> they want humor that they know what to expect, and I feel like we. None of those shows gave people. I mean, we performed at gay bars for God's sakes, and that was some. Of, the funny thing is, some of those shows had the best audience members, but were the worst ran shows. Like as far as it goes, I and mean, like everyone talks about. Yeah, in the you hear it through the grapevine, some people say Chico shows were the worst shows. I've had just as bad shows <laughs> outside of Huntington as those were uh, not put on by that small Mexican man. Do you guys think Hooters girls, Hooters girls get paid workers' compensation if they get breast cancer on the job? <laughs> well, I wanted to know, so I asked the manager there, and he got really pissed. He like looked at me, and was like, "No, of course not. We just send them to work at our other place called a Hooter." <laughs> Man, this guy's fucked up. I love that. No, that's good. That's good. I wrote these just for you, man. That's awesome. So, have you, you ever heard that phrase, it's hard out there for a pimp? I think that's true. But I still think that it's harder out there for the prostitute. At least if I have anything to fucking say about it, it is. It should be. You're doing it right. A lot of people don't like those jokes because they say I'm playing off the fact that those women are victims of breast cancer and prostitutes, they're victims. And I started thinking like, what's the two worst type of victims ever? And it would probably be like a rape victim and a burn victim, which is it's fucked up. But there is a bright side to that. Like, if, let's say if someone, you know, who was a rape victim became a burn victim, that would be awful, that'd be the worst ever. But there is a bright side, like I said. At least she'd never ever have to worry about getting raped again. <laughs> a lot of you aren't laughing. I didn't see Freddy Krueger walk in. So, I don't know why there's this. Mitchell. Is he hiding in your hair? Yeah. He's a good boy. Chill, bitch. Calm down. Just calm down. If I were ever a wrestler, uh -huh. this would be part of my ensemble. Wow. Yes. It's pretty sick. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, like a champ, dude. You look like a hero. One more. One more. Just one more. Just one, one more. more. Chico! And that's why you bombed even harder. There's nothing like getting a kill. Like, when you, when you kill it on a joke, you just throw down, and it, it all just rolls off so nicely, all your timing's perfect, and just the crowd just dies laughing. Oh man. It, it's a feeling that no adjective can do justice. It's just great, man. Uh, you guys know that Stephanie Meyer, the lady that wrote Twilight, you know she's a Mormon? No. Kind of makes sense that a Mormon can get legions and legions of people to rave over crap that's totally retarded. <laughs> I think, man, I think that being able to watch these cats grow and, and, and uh, grow, yeah, grow and grow and develop as artists is, a, is man, that's lucky to do because uh, a lot of the cats are really, really artistic and they don't even understand how. And together, I think they pull something out of each other. And there's a glow that goes around all of them. I don't think they even see that I can see, and I, it really, uh, it really kind of ills me when I see them not get along. And I try not to get in or try, you know, uh, or, or take a side. I just, I just always want them to end whatever will, whatever would stop the progress. Because when they work in numbers, 
there's a scene here that, I mean, I've been in 41 states, 41 states. From that time I did the open mic, 41 states to this day. And that's with, that's with the, uh, with time that I didn't even work the road. There's a scene here, you know? There's a culture in a way. You know, it's there. It's definitely there. It's, it's definitely there. Try to start a club for us to perform at after the funny boom. And after we saw how great the Chico shows were going. Uh, I don't know, it started off pretty fun. Like, the first month was great. So I got singled out, um, and a lot of my friends are telling me, uh, um, some give, give me some advice and whatnot of what I should do. And um, one of my friends, one of my fucking month, one of my. Hello? What? We was only supposed to do it once a month, and then it went really good the first night, so we got to do it every Friday, and I think people just got tired of seeing the same people every Friday or Saturday over and over again. So then when we did bring somebody, or when you did bring somebody from out of town, nobody cared. Good for him. Good for him that he tried to set up shows, but unfortunately what he doesn't realize is that there are more people out there that hate him and that actually like him. Um, there, I don't watch 30 Rock every week because I don't have the time. I can't imagine there being a class of people that have the time and money every week to come watch me try out a new set. Like, what kind of like, animal would that be? Some sort of bizarre millionaire who gets off on um, wasting money and watching people not be funny? Uh, Landau, what's his name? Land, 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 how you pronounce his name? Like every time I hear it, I just think of Billy D. Williams. And they're like, he won! And I'm like, yeah, but he betrayed his friends. Because <laughs> I'm a nerd. What's his name? Landau? 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 That's a horse he lives. Like, the fact that a black man from Logan County can be on the news associated with that much money and no police hotline is extremely inspirational. <laughs> Seriously. Blocks of Logan County is celebrating. <laughs> he's, on, you know? he's, he's on his way to Vegas. We're two people away from being segregated again. <laughs> And I just think like uh, like it's a really good idea to have a um, to have that kind of thing, but that um, there just you know just aren't enough people in Huntington. Initially, I think it was good, but I think as there was there was a known pressure behind the whole thing that there that, that money was trying to be made that it was definitely a business venture. Um, I think that pressure and that tension is what is what killed it. Um, you know, initially with with all of that stuff, there was talk about building a name, building a brand, and doing shows with just the idea behind it of building the name, of getting a reputation. And I think the the cart was put before the horse. I don't think the reputation was ever built. And and so instead, there was all this focus on making money and bringing in people. Never watched me perform either. Yeah, we have we have people that would never get a chance to hit the back room, or we'd have people that would build up three or four quick good open mics, and then we'd show up with good material and 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 good a good experience and then he would look at us like this was our first time doing comedy and wouldn't even pay attention to us yeah. at times and I felt like at other times we'd have somebody who was killing off his radar yeah. that, that we would then say hey man this guy's been doing this and he's like I haven't seen or heard anything about that why should I yeah. give him a spot so we'd have people that just almost lucked in to having stage time and then we had people that were just 
churning joke after joke, working hard crowds, and trying to get a shot, and they never even got noticed. Yeah. Or if they got noticed, it was dismissively. Now, I have a dog, her name's Enola Gay, and if anybody else has a dog, you know if you ever drop food on the floor, here comes the dog, slop, slop. <laughs> Do not ever, guys, pull out and blow your flip-flop, plop, plop, on your girl's tummy, tum tum. Especially if your dog, like my dog, has a habit of wanting to watch you fuck. Because she just sees that as more food that you have thrown away on the floor. Next thing you know, Nola is up on the bed, slop, slop with the plop, plop. And the bitch acted like she had committed a sin. <laughs> she acted like she committed a sin. I was like, shit, no. Plop, plop from the flip, flop on your tummy, tum, tum, and here comes the dog, slop, slop with the plop, plop. I'm kind of like a Dr. Seuss book now. <laughs> the fella running the show in the back room, like, didn't want us doing shows at anywhere else. Me and Aaron Stone set up shows on the same night as his show at a different place and he viewed that as a threat because he is the boss and you know is the boss and that's actually documented that he's the boss so the backroom show started up uh in uh, like june i think um a little bit before that uh aaron stone had set up a show at tuscali's a local italian eatery uh and they had they had had shows there before uh, he was told by uh, that he could, uh, that the show was fine, didn't matter. Um, Stone goes, okay, he books um, Josh McDonald, Cody Lambert. Uh, the backroom shows start running on Saturdays. Tescali's show is scheduled for a Saturday. They're scheduled the same night. <laughs> throws a shit fit. When the funny boats, I told you about all the comics got coming together, trying to put shows together, and <laughs> was one of them. And we all kind of called ourselves the Legion of Underground Comics. Well, that pa this past week, probably four weeks ago is when it originally started, all that shit has been thrown out the door because we scheduled the show here tonight. Aaron drops the bombshell that he is, that he has a promoter coming in, a booker coming in. So, man, he got me for, for setting the show. Like I said, I didn't book the show. They just wanted to do it. I just said, all right, let's do it. We do it on Saturday nights. We've done it five times. The son of a bitch knew about it a month and a half ago. I told him about it. I was going to see if he wanted to come up here and perform. And all he told me was, if it's not in the city, city limits of Huntington, I don't look at it as competition. I said, well, shit, I guess he don't want to perform. That's why I'm going to do the show without him. People who, who fight for a higher position always constantly have to stay in this perpetual state of fighting constantly to get higher and higher, which makes both sides better. But when it gets to the point to where, uh, especially on a local level, people really don't get along with each other, and nothing happens as a result, that's when it's bad. Like uh, Huntington in particular, um, people will fight and, pe and comics will get banned from performing at, at a bar. For their best interest, it really was better for them to go and work for, and perform for this booker. Um, so they did that and I don't think Stone had hard feelings against them. I know I told them, you know, best wishes to do it and I agreed that if they dropped out I would do the Tescali show. I mean no guys I understand where they were coming from they want to be able to perform often I do too but the show was already booked and we're doing it anyway right so I started thinking about it. this legion of underground comics is no more because I've been banned from a club that don't even exist <laughs> and, I, and because of that show Somebody who stepped up and helped us out, Mr. Adam Culver, he, uh, this is the only thing I've ever felt bad about in stand-up comedy. And uh, Culver said not to worry about it. He was okay. He was okay with the situation. Uh, but Culver wound up getting banned. And, you know, Culver, you know, he's fairly new to the game. And so when he lost that outlet, like, he pretty much lost everything. Well, then we can book some guys here tonight. Like we had three people mentioned on the bill, and uh, as you can see, only one of them showed up. He like threatened them, said, "You're not going to ever get to perform on my stage if you do this show." So they backed out. But it's all right. Uh, and so myself, Aaron Stone, and Jason Evans did test galleys, um, while everyone else uh, did the back room show. I was thinking there is no more underground comics. There's just the underground comic. Me, bitches, me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mr. Underground, and I wear that badge of, badge of fucking honor on my arm. That's right, I'm going to start the Underground Comic Railroad. I'm going to run that bitch right up to the steps of the I will rescue you. Rescue!
rescue the oppressed comics of the city of Huntington and the Burbersville area and help bring them back to salvation. And salvation, bitches, is right here to Sally's in Burbersville. Oh. You hear that? We ended up getting a crowd tonight. I just, the only thing I got to say about that is the, the particular person that we're talking about that I'm not allowed to mention. I actually wanted to work with him in the beginning. I mean, I did. I, I offered him. I mean, I've been, he was the first one that I ever went to. And uh, if I could have got his uh, help, and he would have got my help, I think we would have went a long way. And that's just, you know, speaking from the top. Only because of his connections and this and that. But I had the brains, and I don't mean to brag, but yeah, I had the brains to do the things that I'm doing. And the way to do it is go through the community and this and that. But I think the, the biggest problem with the backroom shows was the uh, uh, lack of promotion. There wasn't enough promotion. There wasn't enough... Uh, I think it pretty much got burnt out. Um, I think overall just the pressure of trying to make money and then how that pressure um, kind of twisted things into the bullying situation. Um, I, I think that's why it finally ended. Um, when you're standing out on the street yelling about how much your crowd sucks, as the crowd walks by you, you can't expect them to come back. You can't expect them to tell anybody to come to your show. It's not going to work. Huntington is a, is a small city by the river. In 1937 or 27, I can't remember, it was um, covered up by the Great Ohio River. So basically, um, the psychic damage from, from that lingers to this day, and everyone is constantly terrified of having the small modicum of life they've eked out ripped from them by the universe so um, basically no one ever says anything or does anything and um, there's lots of people doing very interesting things but um, basically um, other people don't like to go and see it because everyone is very very interested in what they're doing and not very interested in what anyone else is doing and I am the largest and the most egregious example of this in that I'm very very interested in the five or six things I like to do and have zero interest in anything anyone else is doing and I and I actually hate and resent the fact that they are trying to do something in my city that is creative or interesting so I root against them and when they fail I um, feel an immense welling up of pleasure that is greater than anything else I've ever experienced in my life and that in essence is what it's like to live in this city is um, you never accomplish anything and when someone you know doesn't accomplish something you that's what makes you feel good that's what that's what makes you feel good is when someone else fails this is, this is how you wear shop material. You just you start pulling stuff out of every... Feed me popcorn! Anything or it's, it's, not, it's never fun. Are you doing a tutorial on and comedy? Bro, it's just amazing any of us have come up with any material ever with just the random stuff that comes out of our mouths. Hey, I think especially this guy. Hey, I just, I just spit like four words out and hope it's funny. I just played Tim McGraw records backwards, and then the satanic verses, that's all my comedy jokes come from. It's just Tim McGraw records backwards. And yeah, I know you're thinking, Tim McGraw, where, where the fuck do you find a Tim McGraw record? But it has to be the record, it doesn't work right. Yeah. You know where you find them? In hell! No, it should be fucking dumpsters. Like that. <laughs> but unfortunately it's not, it's Walmart. I'm James Chase. How's my hair? You're, you know you're an alcoholic if you, if you order a fish bowl of alcohol. You know what I mean? Like, like this, 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 it looks like a crystal ball, doesn't it? Like, it's gonna tell my future. I see you with a fat chick with a cleft lip. Oh, man. <laughs> I see you regret it tonight. Oh, fuck. I've been bouncing around the last past couple of years. Um, 
I started out in Gainesville, Florida uh, when I started doing stand-up and I did that there for two years and then um, I got accepted into West Virginia University and I went up there for a year and a half and uh, I started doing comedy up there and I started um, an open mic up there and it's the guys took over after I left and uh, it's still running today and it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. I almost got carried away though because I was at a bar one night and Kung Fu Fighting started playing. <laughs> Do you have any idea how hard it is to get a girl to go home with you when you kick her in the throat? <laughs> it's not that hard, you just drag her to the car. <laughs> I was at West Virginia for a little while and I was getting into my second semester there and I had about a year left of college and my buddy Jamie called me up and he was like, hey, let's uh, we're moving to Myrtle Beach. There's a comedy club down here. How about you move down here and try to do the stand-up like, full time? And it was too enticing and I went down there and I worked as a server and I did stand-up and I won a competition. And... I think Charlie Brown was a total pimp. Him and Lucy were totally getting down in that doghouse. That's why Snoopy always slept on the roof. I, I hate that aspect that I don't get to do it as much as I would like because there's nowhere to do it around here. I mean, yeah, we do got Tuscali's, which is cool every now and then. And there is Black Sheep Burrito, I guess, when school's in session, but like, there's no comedy club anymore. And I, I hate that. Right now, they're doing some open mic stuff Some that's quite often at a place called Black Sheep. It's a burrito beer place. We got a good bunch here, you know. I I, I really, you know, I really enjoy having just moved here. I've enjoyed meeting everybody. We had the Funny Bone here, which was a f shit. It was a four star club. It was a great club. Like it was literally one of the best clubs within. I mean, I'd say it was it was a really good club up here. And I, I actually had the privilege and the opportunity to work there as a, as an MC, and back in two thousand eight and. Uh, it was a great club. The rooms were always full. Like it was, a, it was a lot of fun. It was actually, I'd say, it was one of the best shows. I've, one of the best weeks of comedy I've ever done was at the Funny Bone. So you have this huge, successful. I mean, at, at one point it was successful in my eyes. I mean, like the shows were packed and everything, and then it closes down, and then you know, having the show be in here, you're left with this pocket of guys that used to go there to do time on stage. And, you know, not really, they had to start their own thing, you know? And I don't really know what happened in between the Funny Bone show and down and the time I got here. Um, but, I don't know, when I did, I f figured out who the comics in town were, and I started talking to them, and then I, you know, got everybody's opinion, and then I started doing these shows at Black Sheep, and I've been having a lot of fun doing it. It's been a lot of, it's been a really good time. But if I have a kid, I'm seriously, I'm going to name him Darth. And I'm just going to let the Star Wars references just like take over his childhood, you know? See if I can find a pediatrician for Darth Barble. <laughs> you know? See if they'd be afraid to approach him with a needle, you know? He'd be all like, no. Actually, he wouldn't say no then. But 30 years later, I'm going to re-add his baby footage. <laughs> Put that shit in there. Because I'm a visionary. So we were, at, we were at a party, and uh, all of a sudden Nickelback comes on. What did you say? Mom, exactly. Nickelback comes on, and there's that one guy who's like, Nickelback! <laughs> Holy shit, turn it up! And, and you're just like, oh my god, why the hell am I at this party? But then, you, then, then everything come clarity sets in, and you realize it's just to kill that one fucking guy. <laughs> you're like, I didn't think my life had purpose. But now I know I was born with a destiny. The destiny is to put a medieval mallet, like a mace, into this man's skull. Because he likes Nickelback. Don't like the band, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> not like the band. Well, if I could put it another way, there's not been a horrible band plane crash in a lot of So Jesus said to listen, take them boys home. <laughs> take them home, guy. <laughs> I've been in a long distance relationship. I had part of my family move to Montana. <laughs> <laughs>
I want to make a prequel to the movie Friday the 13th and call it Thursday the 12th. <laughs> Ever since I was 15 years old, I've only been known by one name. Lurch, the guy off from off the Adams family. Yeah, I don't really see it. Maybe a little bit. I am tall, skinny, I uh, do have that voice when I want to use it. It sucks though because I'm 33 now and nobody knows my real name. Some of my best friends, some friends here tonight, honestly think my name is Lurch. And what's worse, when I look back in life, is over half the women I ever slept with only knew me as Lurch. And then I realized what kind of a woman sleeps with a man they only know as Lurch. They're whores. Yeah, seriously, if I was a girl and like my girlfriend was like, Yeah, I looked up a Lurch rap last night. I'd be like, honey, you need to get tested. <laughs> So I just got a new pair of shoes. I'm not wearing them. I, lo I love them. I love the new shoe smell. I love that. Don't we love? I love it so much. It makes me wonder if that's what Asian children's hands smell like. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's definitely not what Asian men's hands smell like. <laughs> they smell like punches. <laughs> well, karate chops. <laughs> Sets. Are you going to wow us? I'm underprepared. Dude, don't even lie. If you're anything like me, you have like Hey Arnold Ian Nolte shrine in your closet. <laughs> it's made out of like chewed gum and like shampoo and stuff. I don't know. You love Ian Nolte. Yeah. Who doesn't? Nobody loves him more than me. <laughs> I do comedy because that's what I was born to do. Just don't know anything else. Making people laugh. <laughs> Making people laugh. That's, I don't know. When you hear people laugh a lot, that's not even a lot. Just there could be one person in the back, fake laughing. Just ah! No, it doesn't matter. You gotta laugh from somebody. That's enough to make you keep going. That's when they don't do anything at all. Is when you're just like, oh, maybe I should put burgers. You know, I, I, I can't. It's in me now. I can't not. I can't not do something like this. I've thought about like trying to get into sketches or improv or just writing, but I think there's always going to be a place. Like uh, I'm going to be doing stand up. And I'm going to be doing stand up here for a, for a couple more years uh, until I can. I'm not saying that I'll never move out because I feel like I have a better chance of moving on and getting to do this more uh, if I, if I go to a bigger market. But. Um, I don't know. I sort of feel stupid even bringing this up, but uh, the first show I ever did in Baltimore, I got first place at the, uh, it was a contest, it was a contest, I got first place, and after the show, oh, I'm sorry, before the show, I told Henry I wanted to kill the audience, you know, I wanted to kill, that's the term in comedy they, they use for like, when you do well, I mean, I know you guys know that, people wouldn't just watch this and not know about the fucking thing, I sound like a douchebag right now, but yeah. So he gave me this, it's a bullet for an SKS, and I, I carry it, like a lot of people don't even know this, but I, I wear it before uh, big shows or shows that I feel like I'm going to need a little extra help because I just, my material or whatever. I don't know, I'm not generally a superstitious person or a person who believes in luck or anything, but I do always generally do it. Like I said, I got first place that the time I wore this, and then every competition after that I've always placed in it somehow when I've had this bullet. Uh, in my, I usually wear it in my left pocket here, sometimes down here. But it's sort of weird because sometimes I feel like I'm going to go into a place they're going to search me or something. I'm going to have this bullet on me. But yeah, uh, bullet for killing the audience. Some of them you really actually want to use this on. Uh, like to, to really kill their brains out. Kill their brains out. Is that acceptable? You want to eat their face off. Oh my gosh, look at you, you're so big. You don't even care about the baby gay anymore. <laughs> you have one bad set, so you throw in the towel on everything. You throw in the towel on life and like, yeah, you just, <laughs> Yeah, one joke doesn't work, so you don't ever want to be a stand-up comedian again. It's weird. You gotta, you gotta, 
you got to relate to people. You got to you got to you got to strike a chord. And, and when you really when you when you write a joke, and you write a joke that, that affirms people's beliefs, or it changes somebody's mind, or you make a connection with that person in some form or some manner, and they laugh and they they applaud. And you get a whole room of people to think like that and like a joke. I mean, it's, it's almost like when a song gives you chills, man. Like you're really... <clears throat> I mean, you're doing good for the world. You're making people forget about their day. It's almost in that moment when you're, when you're performing and you're killing and you're really like slaying people, everybody in that room has forgot about their life or, or forgot about if they've had, been having a bad day or has... I mean, it's... I guess that's where stand-up becomes art, is when you captivate people through it. I like to tell jokes. I like to think of and then tell, say, I like to think of the joke, and then remember the joke, and then later I like to say the joke to somebody. And that's more or less the, that's why, that's, how, that's what I, yeah. I don't really know what I don't really know what other people would consider paying dues. I feel like it's... I feel it's like working your ass off to develop your craft to the point where you can... to the point where nobody can deny you being a good comedian. Like you have to... you're gonna have to... you're gonna have to do some shit shows. You're gonna have to... you're gonna have to bomb a couple times. You're gonna have to, uh, you may not get to perform at an open mic, you're gonna have to perform in front of five people. It's, paying your dues can come in many different forms, I would say. I don't even think I've paid my dues. I think I'm paying them. I, I know I'm nowhere near where I wanna be as a stand-up, and so I'm, I'm, I don't know if you're ever really done paying your dues. Because that would sort of, I would sort of see that as like saying, like, all right, I'm a comedian. I've really, I've got here, and I feel like once you reach that, once you reach that mental process, it's sort of you, you find yourself in danger of stagnating. I mean, I always feel weird calling myself a comic, and yeah, calling other people I know comics. I mean, I guess we do try to to be that. Uh, we do try to make people laugh, but we have done enough shitty shows to be taken seriously. I think I think what we need more of now is more good shows that'll help us hone in the craft because it's the bad shows that make you stronger, but it's the good shows that keep you coming back for longer. I think that rhymed. I didn't mean for it to. It sounds like a Celine Dion song. You, you all let this guy record like everything and he has like everything on camera. Great. Yeah, alright fucking Mr. Brainwash. It's true that I'm traveling on. I think the road. What? <laughs> there is number one to be the funniest motherfucker I know, Mr. Aaron Stone. It's true that I'm traveling on. I think the road's too strong. Next, uh, next time we're coming to the stage, is actually. Uh, he runs uh, the improv yeah. forever. And forever. He runs everything that has to do with improv. Uh, guys, big round of applause for Mike Jones. Mike Jones, I know. Thanks. I love that I keep getting the, the I run the improv, uh, whatever, the improv room, and then I come up here and suck balls, and everybody's like, why the fuck does this kid run the improv room? <laughs> That's cool. Find a bone and just wonder if it's human.
traveling on I almost hate the audience. <laughs> they can, sometimes they can just fuck right off. Yeah, like, totally. Like, yeah, listen, this is my joke. I wrote this. You paid to sit there. So shut the fuck up and try and accept this into your life. And, and that's the way I'm going to approach certain things in my comedy just straight up because it's my fucking comedy. If I'm going to want to do something, I'm going to want to do it my way, the way I want to do it. And I don't give a shit if you're going to like it or not. I'm going to say it because I know that somewhere there's someone who will get it. And that's what it is. I'm giving it to you guys. It's a joke for you to take and to accept and to laugh at, you bastards. And I hope that you can spread that or somebody else will find that just so that somebody somewhere laughs. Oh.